thanks again uh, this topic is on blockchain interoperability uh, my name is vinayak pandit i blockchain and supply chain strategy at ibm research based out of and this point of view really is a joint work with my colleagues from ibm research um, venkat raman ramakrishna rama in short and armias abibe who was part of ibm research um, till recently yeah so here is the talk that i'm going to give right so i want to blockchain interoperability what are the drivers for blockchain interoperability what are the unique challenges you know when it comes to blockchain interoperability because it very widely studied topic and has been around with us uh, at least uh, for last 2 to 3 decades and what are the principles of interoperability in the blockchain right so that will be the background topic a brief um, overview it's not an exhaustive overview of uh, some of the emerging patterns right when it comes to blockchain interoperability then i will provide an overview of two of the projects which are focused on this topic within the hyperledger umbrella one is the hyperledger cactus and then second is a hyperledger labs project that we call as weaver right my goal will be to try and cover this as quickly as possible so that we can have some time for uh, discussions okay so drivers for blockchain interoperability right so if you can really look at this question from two points of view one is looking at the the stage in the technology evolution when it comes to blockchain right in some sense especially in the enterprise setting it is still in its infancy right and we have many different abstractions of the concept and uh, or many different implementations of these abstractions right and these uh, and these abstractions right are actually implemented on different type technical stacks right so there is really a heterogeneity of technical stacks and then we have networks that are specialized on certain kind of purposes and uh, we have a certain kind of uh, networks or slash uh, you know meant to build general purpose um, example we have certain networks which are meant only for um, certain networks which are uh, meant only for certain aspects of trade finance whereas uh, we might have very general networks looking at all aspects of uh, let's say trade so that's one aspect technology uh, the heterogeneity of technical stacks different abstractions and implementations and the second aspect is really the way the technology adopt in the um, enterprise setting right so the adoption is really a very gradual adoption and the adoption through use cases right so people are finding meaningful use cases that give immediate benefit many of them have very limited um, um, scope in terms of their operations and most cases are built are built by that come and define network bound the types these boundaries are fairly narrowly defined and the use cases themselves uh, even if you look at it from the point of a single organization they just cover a slice of the business right for example you know uh, point of view of a single organization right um, you know its um, trade logistics related aspect might be covered on a trade logistics network um you know that. and uh, its trade finance related aspects might be covered on another network like uh, we dot trade right and uh, therefore um, many of these networks they are complementary for example, trade finance network and trade logistics networks they are complementary in nature but isolated as of today right so this is the reason 
that you know we have a really complementary but isolated set of networks that are coming up that are coming up on a heterogeneity of technical stacks which uh, really call probability i'll not spend much time on this uh, chart that the timing seems to be quite right when it comes to blockchain interoperability, right? So in the last two years on the left-hand side, I have pointed out some of the market research reports that have come out, right? And you can see familiar names like IDC, World Economic Forum, EU Commission for Restaurants, right? And then some of the major vendors when it comes to uh, blockchain adoption, like Corda, IBM, Accenture, they all have come out with their own view of interoperability in which there are a lot of commonalities, right? So, which is actually a good sign that uh, this is uh, the right time to look at this particular topic. Um, so, what are the objects of interoperability, right? Um, so, as I said, you know, we have networks that are coming up in isolation and in some sense, the picture on the left hand side, you know, depicts that, right? So you might have a, a you know, a logistics network, which is uh, really not uh, talking to network or a, you know, a trade finance network and so on and so forth, right? And what we really want them to be able to do is to kind of seem and give a, an update user as if that user is seamlessly working across a complex workflow by connecting all these uh, different uh, networks, right? So remove the network and data silos, right? So that's actually one important thing. And second thing is it will allow individual networks to focus on what is they are most competent, right? Like the payment network can focus exclusively on payments, a logistics network can exclusively in their and scaling logistics network, etc. And it will create very uh, new and novel type of network effects, right? For example, certain kind of business interactions that today do not take place, let's say between uh, a logistics, trade finance, and insurance uh, kind of categories might actually start in the future. Uh, right, and that's why on the right hand side, you know, we have even de depicted that as a pro as a, as an outcome of blockchain interoperability, we might even have new networks that come up. And, uh, overall, uh, we expect that this will blockchain market size, and you know, increase liquidity of assets within the networks, and actually create a, a next level of efficiency. Right. So here, I'll just take a pause. And just go back to the chat room to see that uh, to make sure that you are all able to view the slides uh, uh, easily. Okay, I'll presentation mode, but that bit of a complication for me. The screen sharing issues I'm facing. Still, let's try it. Okay, so uh, you know, blockchain interoperability uh, um, uh, it's simple technical matter, right? So as as technology really focus on levels of interoperability, right? Um, you know, the technical layer which really looks at wire protocols, what kind of you know delivery guarantees are there, etc. Syntactic layer which focuses on the protocol structures and how the payloads are formatted and so. On. And then the semantic layer, right, which is where the blockchain aspect really starts coming into in the form of different, um, you know, type of call messages, uh, whether they are data transfer, asset transfer, asset exchange, we will actually look at what they mean. And, um, you know, associated concepts like state transfer, cryptographic proofs, identity, etc. Right. But this alone, we know, is not really sufficient to realize the full benefit of intro. What are really important are uh, existence of, uh, you know, uh, domain standards in application areas where the needs to work. In the case of supply chain and logistics, 
you know, existence of uh, uh, standards like GS1, etc., which will allow, um, you know, the underlying exchange across different blockchain networks to be made sense of at the application layer are very important. And there are already existing standards there, which is actually a very important uh, aspect which will make that up. And we also want to acknowledge that even at the governance and legal regulations level, there are roles for other parties to play and there are already parties playing role here as we have noted here, for example, at the governance and enablement level, World Trade Organization, International Chamber of Commerce are playing a very active role and people are actually advocating and considering um, you know, changes to local laws and regulations to actually make uh, blockchain based uh, business flows um, valid. Right. And uh, to call out here that when we say, when we talk about blockchain in the context of multiple networks, one can actually think of different integration patterns. And hence, we want to call out the pattern that we are most concerned with, right? So one pattern is very simple. Right, so you are a big organization, big retailer, and you know, and you are participating in a uh, supply network. You are participating in a trade logistics network. You are participating in a trade finance network, and so on. And you just want to get a single view of your participation across different networks, right? And this is actually very easily possible. Uh, by just actually having a single peer which participates across multiple networks, right? So the second one is that, you know, you might want a single network in which parties bring up the peer infrastructure in the way that they actually feel most comfortable with, right? For example, you know, you might have peers that are on uh, on prem that are uh, on different cloud services and so on, and you should be able to orchestrate a single network and this is possible today, right? And the third pattern, which, uh, you know, the, the interaction between the two networks actually take place at the application layer through API. Okay, parties exposing those APIs. This is also possible today, but the problem with this pattern is that the underlying decentralization tenets that are associated with the decentralized test actually get lost right so the we are really interested is in this what i'm calling out as a pattern four in which the networks are interacting while enabling data and value exchange right while preserving the dlt tenets right so this is really the most important aspect that uh, we you know we want to kind of and this is the pattern that we are really uh, focused on, right? So let me very briefly call out what makes blockchain interoperability really hard, right? So here you can see there are two networks, uh, you know, uh, one on the left-hand side, which is in orange, and one on the right-hand side, which is in brown, right? And, uh, and, and really, uh, you know, the network A, Natural uh, definition of network boundary can reason about the identities, transaction, and state of everyone inside its network, which are represented in orange. It can do the same for entities, transactions, and states on uh, which are in the brown network. But when we create blockchain interoperability between these two networks, what we are really doing is we are creating a new boundary of trust which encompasses all, right? Which is while network A continues to operate as an independent network in itself, it should be able to reason about the identities, transaction and state of the, right? And that's really hard because while we want to give the full independence to networks, you want to allow them to reason about each other and, um, and while preserving uh, decentralization, right, without introducing trusted third parties and really the big challenge. Right. And the really the spectrum of blockchain interoperability, right? Uh, I just wanted to, although I will not be spending much time on it, is that, you know, 
we should we, we, if you have a for example you might have a you know in the context of fabric you might have a network in which there are two different channels and they may want to actually interoperate amongst each other so that is one level of interoperability interoperability is that there are two different networks that are built on let's say a fabric network. one is a supply chain finance network another is a logistics network and you they should be able to exchange in information between each other right another level and then you might have a network which is built on one protocol like let's say a fabric trade finance network and you might have a payment network which is on um, let's say ethereum they should be able to interact with each other that's the third level of um, interoperation right and then as i said for the sake of completion you might also have the application layers talking with each other and you all systems to be able to interrupt with non dlt system although for the purpose of this talk we will be focusing exclusively on these three but right so just to say so the unique challenges of is really you know the fact that the ownership of a state in a single party system lies with just one party and if that party says something about its state you can trust it whereas in multi in a multi party system like in a blockchain network the state is really owned by the collective and that is defined by the participants and the consensus protocol of that and and a party which is really trying to consume right uh, that information uh, we have shown for three different patterns here necessarily have the full view of um, you know the either the set of participants or the or each of the uh, transactions that actually get recorded on the network from which it is actually trying to consume the info so the roles that proofs and verification play is very important and then finally uh, you know in the traditional context interoperability we typically talk about data interoperability right people are able to exchange messages but here we are actually also talking in terms of assets uh, which is right so the assets uh, that uh, we, you know we are interested in is asset exchange right so the uh, essentially the change of ownership of an asset in a source network and a corresponding change of ownership in another network right so for example delivery versus payment in the context of trading so this is one classic example asset transfer right so here you know we want the movement of an asset from one source ledger to a consuming ledger right so the asset the asset cannot be double spent which means that on the source network the asset should be locked and then be released to be used in the consuming ledger right simple example here could be movement of money from a wholesale cbdc uh, retail cbdc net. and the third pattern that we are talking about here which is not covered that much in the literature is what we call as data sharing right which is the consuming ledger is able to query and obtain state ledger with a proof of validity right an example is a trade finance network right uh, wants to make sure that there is a valid bill of lading in a trade logistics network before issuing letter of credit right so this is another right? i will uh, try to cover a little faster now so that we have some time for discussion right um four different emerging patterns in the literature uh one is a very simple one uh, which happens in most token exchanges that are there today centralized token exchanges right there is a trusted intermediary which is exchange helping exchange assets then we have a uh, trusted federation right in which there is a a set of entities uh, which are federating the ex exchange of uh, assets as well as information and uh, so you can actually think of this itself as a network which is uh, uh, 
doing this and like this is like a primary network and these are secondary network and uh, this is a pattern that is uh, you know uh, that is followed by some of the networks like cosmos and polka dot etc and then we have uh, you know interoperability in which there are no intermediaries right so acts independently uh, and simple example here is uh, you know asset x using a protocol like uh, hash time lock contract and then uh, we have which uh, through a project which i will be covering in some uh, detail is uh, you know there is a consortium of network uh, cross chain validators in which the consortium has presence of cross chain validators in each one of the networks and then they talk amongst in, in, in themselves to create um, federation right so this is the one pattern that i kind of talked about uh, not will not go into detail but essentially the primary network uh, provides uh, resources as well as structural and sometimes in terms of the data and exchanges that the secondary networks consume from other networks. Uh, there are side chain plasma pole and so on and uh, the other pattern which we said is for the networks to operate independently and then basically uh, uh, interact with each other using uh, the format of claims and proofs right so this network is making a particular claim and providing a proof of that state and this network is able to consume these proofs can be as simple as digitally signed messages in permission networks um if you know any is like sufficient information about the uh, source network will be in the form of merkle proofs and zero knowledge proofs as well right so again a very quick uh, summary uh, right uh, and the permission less uh, space we have interoperability uh, like ilps if, uh, is a very well known uh, pattern Polkadot commerce, like as I said, networks as intermediaries, right? And uh, on, in the permission space, we have um, integration frameworks like Hyperledger Cactus, independent networks without intermediaries, Hyperledger, right? So we will talk a little bit about these projects, right? Cactus is actually a Hyperledger incubation project, right? And this follows this pattern in which there is a consortium of what we call as cross chain validators and the consortium has some of its verifiers they are called participate in each one of these networks right so they are not part of the uh, consensus um, uh, you know building the consensus in these networks but they participate and observe all the state changes right and when information needs to be ferried across uh, you know, cross chain validators have a way to talk amongst each other they run a consensus amongst themselves and based on that consensus they allow for exchange of uh, value and uh, information right um, so more details can be found in the links i have given so it's a, a plugin architecture meaning you know they are providing maximum flexibility in terms of different ledgers to which uh, um, you know interoperability can be enabled by building specific plugins for each type of these ledgers and uh, they do not make any other ledgers themselves and the idea is security by default meaning the you do not have to worry about the security of the framework itself there's a very interesting concept they have called toll free which is uh, that uh, users should be not charged for uh, you know participate users to create interoperation right um, so I, in the kind of quickly cover uh, uh, the weaver project which is uh, a project that we are currently working on from ibm research right um, this is a you know we have built based on the following principles right so we inclusiveness we want to avoid approaches that are specific to any particular dlt implementation we want the networks to retain their independence and um, 
reduce the trust to what is really essential, right? For example, just the idea of the network, right? And privacy by design, which means that any interaction between parties across networks is kept private and confidential and revealed only to those parties that are right. And, and we avoid uh, the presence of uh, trusted third parties, right? And uh, practical considerations very similar to um, cactus, right? Uh, we do not assume any uh, that uh, we do not permit any changes to underlying platform DLT platforms themselves, right? And uh, you do not have to um, worry about already existing network operations and be able to work as is, right? So very quickly, uh, you know this is that you know in the form of uh, we actually allow communication between uh, interacting ledgers. And all of this is uh, by a particular pattern that we call as relay, which is really a component uh, which allows uh, networks to exchange messages of different types, uh, identify different type of messages, whether it is data exchange um, and asset exchange and so on. And the relay is built in such a way that it places very minimal, right? And the relay really cannot. Uh, uh, play any adversarial role in this setting other than perhaps playing a denial of service attack, which can again be mitigated with the uh, replication of uh, relay components. Right? So here is really the broad vision. Uh, you know, we have different type of protocols, including ERP systems, which will be using their own relays. There will be, and then they can actually exchange that and. Uh, um, do asset transfers and so on. That for each of these uh, networks, for uh, the DLT protocols, we have a adapter which is the best uh, SDK for that particular uh, protocol, and that adapter is able to actually identify uh, different message types and convert them into the language that the underlying um, protocol needs to consume and uh, it also is able to talk with the remote other relay uh, components. I'll not spend time on this and uh, maybe uh, you know end it here and see if there are any questions. Any questions? OK, so there's just one question. I'll probably take just one minute. Uh, if you had to implement improbability this year, which protocol would you use? Uh, you know, I think unfortunately that. Right, I think uh, it depends on the use case that you have. Uh, and uh, what kind of uh, trust. You want to work with, as I said, the different patterns assume different trust models, uh, so I do not want to really pick any sites here. Any other questions? Uh, then will we we were be stable enough? Actually, uh, we were is quite stable now. But at least in a quarter from now, we will ex we you know we will be expect ready. It for people to use uh, what we call the data exchange patterns, and by the end of the year, you know, asset exchange patterns. There is a, a question whether uh, it can be a collaboration between Cactus and Weaver. I mean, we definitely do not rule it out. As I said, there are a lot of uh, commonalities, considerations. There, there could be slight changes in the technical approaches, and uh, we believe uh, while there might be some effort involved in it, there can be an harmonization. But we have not visited that question yet. Okay, I guess we have to end this now. Unfortunately, we are two minutes over. 
please feel free to reach out to me and my collaborators if you have any other questions. Thanks a lot.